Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you that God we have such free access to you in his name. Without that sacrifice, we could not have this privilege. We thank you for it. Fathers, we bow in your presence. If we've sinned against you, forgive us, dear God. The only problem you have with us is sin. Forgive us, Father, because you hold no grudges. Grant us your grace. Grant to us your spirit, Father, that the spirit of truth may guide our minds into truth. I humble myself before you. I really do, as lowly as I can. And I ask you, dear God, take me, use me according to your will. I offer absolutely no resistance. Remind me constantly, Father, that I am in this pulpit for your glory. Tell me what to say, dear God. Tell me when to say it. Tell me how to say it. Bless those listening with comprehension. Bless all those watching online, wherever they are on this earth. Bless them, I pray. Put a double blessing on their children. If there are visitors watching online, put a special blessing on them. And again, put a special blessing on the minister, on all those responsible for the administration of this blessed country. Hear this humble prayer, Father. If anyone listening to me in person or online has COVID-19, heal that person 100%, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. What's our subject? The power of a symbol. If you were walking down the street and you saw a man with a gun in his hand, would you smile and say, thank you, Jesus? No, you wouldn't. You'd probably find another street to take. Because that gun to you is a symbol of danger to your life or someone else's life. That's how you may choose to see it. Someone else may see it as a, a tool used in the sport of target shooting. Someone else may see it as representing a collector's item. People collect coins, people collect stamps, people collect guns. For some, it is one symbol. For another, it's another symbol. Whatever the symbol is, it exerts a power on the person who is viewing that thing. When you see a rainbow, you're not simply seeing a thing of meteorological beauty. As a Christian, you should see a symbol of God's faithfulness to his word. I will never do what? Send a flood again. Not that I will never destroy the world. I will never send another global flood. The rainbow, and there's a rainbow around the throne of God, the faithfulness of God to his word. The rainbow may be a symbol of one thing to you, a symbol of something else to someone else. The power of a symbol. Many churches have crosses. One piece of wood this way, one piece that way. The pieces may have been picked up in a forest somewhere, but when they are arranged in that pattern that is universally recognized, it becomes a symbol that exerts a power. The symbol of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I say again, symbols have power, but what power the symbol exerts is dependent upon how we view that symbol. What am I trying to tell you? Some of you have academic degrees, and you paid a lot of money for them. For many people, a degree is a symbol. It is a symbol of a secure life. It is a symbol, a representation of a good job, a good foundation for my family. It may represent tuition for my children, my mortgage, my car payment. And so I go to school to get a degree. Now, if degrees simply represented acquisition of knowledge and had no economic benefit, how many people would go through the trouble of getting degrees? The Sabbath is a symbol. For some, listen to me carefully, it is a symbol that threatens their livelihood. It is a symbol that threatens peaceful relations with family members. 
It is a symbol that suggests a disruption or a diminution of their esteem and prestige in their community. It is a negative symbol and there are many who have nothing to do with the Sabbath because for them it is a symbol that exerts a negative effect. If I keep the Sabbath, I lose my job. I misrepresent my family that has followed a certain religious tradition for hundreds of years. For many, the Sabbath is a symbol of something negative. There are students for whom the Sabbath is a threat to their academic advancement. And so they take exams, finish my words, on Sabbath. Are you following me? For many students, the Sabbath represents a threat to their academic achievement, to the acquisition of a degree which represents a secure life. Let's look at the God of the Sabbath. See what kind of person he is, and then you tell me if the Sabbath ought to represent a threat to your life. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. What's our subject? The power of a symbol. What does that clock say, my friends? You always tell me. Is that quarter to eight? I'll release you early tonight. What book did I say? What chapter? Reading from what verse? One. Let me pray again. Father in heaven, as I continue this message, give me precise language, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Verse 6, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament, what? Heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. So we have the atmosphere on the second day. Verse 9, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good, and so we have water. Dry land. Verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed. And the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And verse 12 tells us, and the earth brought forth grass, an herb yielding seed, and the tree yielding fruit after his kind. Now we pause. We have the atmosphere on day two. We have water on day three. We have solid food on day three. For our survival, what do we need? Air, water, and food. We're looking at the God of creation in the light of the fact that some Sabbath keepers see the Sabbath as a hindrance and a threat. Air, water, food. Verse 14 of Genesis 1. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. We have sun. We have moon. We have stars. I want you to observe. Vegetation came on day three. 
If you're with me, say amen. amen. The sun was made on day four. Now, does vegetation need the sun in order to flourish? Yes. But vegetation appeared before the sun did. Because vegetation does not grow by the sun. Vegetation grows by the power of God. Ah, uh, you're not with me. Fruit trees thrive by the power of God, not the sun. Now God has marshaled the sun and whatever else to serve his purpose of preserving vegetation. But the power that preserves the tree is the power of the creator, the God of the Sabbath. God wants you to know, you're not preserved by the sun which so many cultures have worshipped over the years. You are sustained by the creator of heaven and earth. Let us go to verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. Finish that verse. And it was so. We have the animals that provide companionship. Not items for the menu. <laughs> Is this microphone working? Animals were made to be friends and companions. We should make a decision to stop eating our friends. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> How can you eat your buddy? <laughs> but let me leave that alone before you walk out en masse. We have air. We have water. We have food. We have companionship in the person of animals. All of this before Adam and Eve were brought on the stage of action. Now you tell me, what is God a specialist at? Providing. This God listening to me now and watching you, he is a specialist in providing. So when he tells you, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, do it. Because you're being commanded by someone who specializes in providing. When he tells you, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Don't tell him, well, I have these bills and these bills, because he has promised, I will open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. What are these windows of heaven? Go to Genesis 7. Our subject, the power of a symbol. Genesis 7, we read verse 11. Do you have that? In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. Finish the verse. And the windows of heaven, come on, were opened. Read the next verse. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now, let me show you how voluminous this flood was. Go to verse 20 of Genesis 7. Are you there? Read with me. What does that say? 15 cubits upward did the what? Waters prevail and the mountains were covered. We are talking about a God who can provide. Are you listening to me? When God opened the windows of heaven, water came down. And combined with the water from under the earth. There was so much water. The highest mountains were covered at a height of 15 cubits. Keep this in mind now and view all your needs as mountains. Uh, nobody's with me. View all your needs as mountains and listen to Malachi 3 verse 10. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse that they may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, there shall not be room enough to receive it. This is a God who provides. And the provision of God is highest upon those who are obedient. Yeah. 
The Sabbath is not a symbol of a compromised life. The Sabbath is not a symbol or a threat to your livelihood. The Sabbath is a constant reminder, among other things, that there is a God in the heavens who knows how to provide. He knows how to provide alternatives when you and I see helplessness. Go to John chapter 6. Let's look at this God. He's on the earth as a human being. He's called Jesus. Because the one who said, let there be light, was Jesus. Are you in John 6? Let me pray again. Father, as I continue, give me a little more of your spirit. Suppress my carnal nature, dear God. Grant me the humility of Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, verse 5, he saith unto Philip, what did he say? When shall we buy bread that these may eat? This is the parable of the feeding of the 5,000. It's the only parable, not parable, sorry, miracle that is mentioned in all four Gospels. The only miracle mentioned in all four Gospels. Matthew 14, uh, Mark 6, Luke 9, and John 6. Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? This is the Creator talking to Philip. Read verse 6. Nice and loud if you have my version. What does that say? And this he said to prove him. Finish the verse. For he himself knew what he would do. You and I have emergencies, not God. You and I have problems, not God. You and I come to a cul-de-sac, not God. And so God said to Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Thank God for verse 6 of John 6. And this he said to prove him. Now for that student with an exam on Sabbath, God is proving you. Whether you'll put him first or you'll put mankind first. The Bible is clear. Commandment 1, thou shall have no other gods before me. And that God can be your degree. That God can be your job. That God can be that romantic interest that goes contrary to the biblical recommendation. And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which have five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Listen to the words of Andrew. There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves. What else did he say? Two small fishes. You can hardly see them. He looks at the five loaves. He looks at the two little fish. And he looks at 5,000 people. And he says to Jesus, what are they among so many? Go to Matthew 14. Let's read the same story. Matthew has slightly different wording, but it's the same event. Same event. They inform Christ that just have five loaves of bread, two fish. What does Christ say in verse 18 of Matthew 14? Bring them hither to me. Come on, say amen. That's all you have, says Jesus? Bring them to me. Because not only am I a provider, I am a multiplier. Bring whatever little you have to me. When they did that, Jesus fed 5,000 men, plus women and children, and the doubting disciples. When they had eaten to their fill, they picked up 12 baskets over and above that flowed from five little loaves and two microscopic fishes. My brothers and sisters, that Jesus who performed that miracle was the one who said, 
Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the tree yielding fruit. This was the same person, the creator of heaven and earth. And as he took care of the multitude then, as he provided in creation for Adam and Eve before they were brought into existence, he is the same yesterday. Come on. Today and forever. The problem is we do not believe. And so God tells us in Malachi 3.10, prove me. Buddha doesn't say that. Confucius doesn't say that. Muhammad doesn't say that. Jesus says, prove me. Now herewith. Because the man or the woman who tests God always comes away impressed with the results. Because God always comes through. And I'm saying to you again, do not see the Sabbath. And I'm stressing my young brothers and sisters who are in universities. And you have a prospect of a job, but you're required to work one Sabbath every six months. Your answer must be no. Or the boss must say, can you work just half an hour after sunrise, after sunset? And your answer must be no. The church has, of all ages, too many cowards. Of how many ages? All ages. We need people who will say like the three Hebrew boys. Our God is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, are you with me? If not, be it known unto thee, O king. We don't want you guessing. Too many of us have our friends who are unsaved guessing as to whether we're Christians or not. Our colleagues in the classroom with us, they're guessing, is this man a Christian? Is she a Christian? We have the world guessing. The three Hebrew boys, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they told Nebuchadnezzar, be it known unto you that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. God set up the seventh-day Sabbath. The principle of the Sabbath is one word, dependence. All of creation depends on God. From the angel Gabriel to a single cell organism. No one will say amen. All creation depends upon God. From the angel Gabriel, the highest angel in heaven, to a single-celled organism depends upon God. There is no system, there is no organism, there is no entity that exists separate from God. And the Sabbath is a reminder that there is a power in the heavens who knows how to take care of his people. When he sent manna in Exodus 16, he told the Israelites he will send twice as much on Friday so they would not have to go when on Sabbath. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe I told you or the church in Berbice, if you make a living on Saturday, who gave it to you? Because God does not provide a living on Sabbath. He doubles up on Friday. I didn't say God does not provide a living. I said he doesn't provide it on the Sabbath. He provides it on Friday, the preparation day, so you are prepared to keep the Sabbath with peace of mind. We need people with reckless faith. And I use the word reckless uh, positively. We need people with a reckless faith. Like Daniel, who was willing to go to the lion's den when he could easily have prayed to a man and then said sorry to God, as so many of us do.
Do it and say sorry. Do it and say sorry. Do it and say sorry. The three Hebrew boys could have bowed in that large crowd. No one would have noticed. They noticed when they refused to bow. No one would have noticed had they bowed because everyone was bowing. They stood apart. Then we need some people who will see the Sabbath as a symbol of a God who provides. We need Seventh-day Adventists who will see the Sabbath as a symbol of the power of the Creator. We need Sabbath keepers who will see the Sabbath as a symbol that all that they need for this life and the life to come is provided by the Creator Himself. The power of a symbol. The Sabbath is not a threat to your livelihood. The Sabbath is a threat to sin. Not to righteousness. Come on, say amen. The Sabbath is a threat to Satan. Not to Christ or his people. And so tonight, I want you to recommit your lives to obey God. One of the problems with sermons, preachers, we preach too many soft sermons. And so people have a soft approach. You tell a Christian you must be ready to literally die for Christ, and the person looks at you as though you are an extremist, which of course you are, because what heaven requires is extreme in the eyesight of an earthly person. As verily as salvation required the death of Christ, salvation from sin requires the death of the sinner. And as verily as sacrifice is God's outstanding characteristic when sin entered the universe, so sacrifice must be ours. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Psalm 50 verse 5. Let me tell you very plainly. You must be willing to honor the Sabbath even at the loss, finish my words, of your life. Not Forget the job your life. But the reason why we disobey the Sabbath and work, because we're preserving our lives. When the devil went to God and God gave him permission to try Job, Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, the devil took all his possessions and came back to heaven. And God said, see, he still preserves his integrity. Satan said in verse 4, I believe, of Job 2, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his life. And the devil was right. We will do anything and everything to save our skins, including disgracing God. But as long as your life means more to you than anything else, the devil has you. Because all he has to do is threaten your life and you leave God. That's all he has to do, threaten your life. But the Bible says... In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, listen carefully, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Someone afraid to die is a slave is not fully free. Someone afraid to die is not fully free. And with respect to spiritual things, someone afraid to die is easily manipulated by the devil. That's why Jesus tells us in Luke 14, 26, if you come to me, you must hate mother, father, brother, sister, and your very life. When he means hate, he means loveless. Faithfulness to God must supersede your life, and mine. And so as Jesus gave his life for us, we must be willing to give our lives for him. Literally, there are people all over the world giving their lives for their countries. Are you following me? Soldiers, special forces. They know they may die, and they go. Policemen know they may die. They go and patrol the streets. Christians are afraid to die for God. At the risk of alarming you, I say again, the power of a symbol. The cross, a symbol of divine sacrifice. The Sabbath, a symbol that God is able to provide. Not only now, but in the world to come. Because the Bible says it shall come to pass that from one new moon to a Sabbath, 
and from one to another, one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me. The Sabbath we observe now will be observed in the new world. The tree of life to which Adam had access until he sinned will be present in the new world. The God who provided before sin, the God who provides during sin, is the God who will provide after sin. Honor God. Honor God's Sabbath. Trust God. His Sabbath is not a symbol of a terrible life. It is not a threat to your security. It is a symbol of the power of God to sustain what he has created. Let me say it again. It is a symbol of the power of God to sustain what he has created. Let me speak to the young men and the young women. If you will say, Father, give me the courage to represent you and take a stand for your Sabbath when I am tested. If you will give me the courage to do that, if that's your decision tonight, stand up. The young people I'm talking to, the young people, especially those in school looking for jobs, give me the courage to represent you regardless of cost. Now let me stress, regardless of cost, obedience to God is non-negotiable. You either obey him or you leave him alone. And now to the adults, if you will say, Father, under all circumstances and at all times, help me to be obedient to you, would you stand? Under all circumstances and at all times, help me to be obedient. The Bible presents obedience as life, disobedience as eventual death. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, thank you so much for your clear word. Thank you for the Sabbath. A symbol of so many things all of them positive when we trust you a symbol of your power to create a symbol of your power to sustain what you have created a symbol of your power to provide day by day moment by moment a symbol of your power to sustain your people in trial and tribulation father when the flood came eight were found worthy when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, one righteous man escaped. Dear God, you've never had the majority on your side. But Father, I pray that all the youth in this building tonight will stand on the side of faithfulness to you. And that when they're tested and tried in the area of exams and work, they will honor the Sabbath as you desire them to do. And while their heads are bowed, and the eyes are closed. Let me speak to my young brothers and my young sisters very quickly. Look back on your life. Let's say the past three months. Look back in your mind the past six months. Has the trajectory of your life been upward or downward? It cannot be flat. It's either upward or downward. If you think it has not been upward, that you want to recommit that life to Christ, absolutely come right to the front. If you think, as you view your life the past six months, the direction has not been distinctly upward, and you want to recommit that life to Christ, come. Come to the front. Don't look around to see who's coming. You come. Salvation is an individual matter. You honestly realize the trajectory of your life has been downward. Recommit that life to your Savior, who at one stage was your age. Recommit it to Him. And tell him from this point on, by his abiding grace and your continual surrender, you want to move upward and forward by his power. Who else is coming? Come. You reverse, you've reviewed your life the past three months or six months. You realize it has not been upward. And you're honest in that evaluation. You want to recommit your life to Christ and make this the point from which you enjoy an upward tradition by his power and your constant surrender. Come. I won't delay you long. Who else is coming? Now is always the best time to make a decision to obey God fully. Come, sister. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I mean that. This is very serious. 
God bless you. God bless you. God is watching right now. God bless you, sister. I mean that sincerely. God bless you. Make that decision with every mitochondrion in your system, every neuron, every cell, every muscle fiber. Make that commitment to Christ. Come, sister, come. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Come, my dear sister, come, come. Any age, come. Sin has no age restrictions. Hell has no age restrictions. Heaven has no age restrictions. Come. If you're coming, come. And then we'll pray. Here's my life day, God. And make that surrender every single day. You may fool me. You may fool the pastor. You may fool the conference. You may fool the union, the division, the general conference. You cannot fool God. Ultimately, you fool yourself. Come. I give you 60 seconds and I pray. Guaranteed. My life has not been on an upward trajectory. Trajectory. And I confess that honestly, Father, I come to my Savior. I want a change in the direction of my life, upward. That's only possible through Christ and our constant surrender. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. 30 seconds. The power of a symbol. The Sabbath is a symbol of power, of victory, provision, overcoming, and divine love. An eternal happiness beginning now. 15 seconds. Then I pray. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Father, look with fatherly mercy and pity and compassion upon those who answer the call. Involve yourself in their lives individually, dear God. Because when you made Adam and Eve, you made them one at a time, not together. The lesson for us is, salvation is an individual matter first. Bless everyone who came, God. Accept this surrender, their Father. The pressures of this world are great, but where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Let's focus on the much more of grace, not the widespread nature of sin. Let's remember the words of your son, Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look unto me and be saved. Don't look to our weaknesses, but look to Christ. Please, God, wrap your elastic arms around all those who came and pull them into your bosom where the devil has no admission. Give them power tonight. And if it suits you to give them life tomorrow, give them power tomorrow. Because the power you give them tonight is only for tonight. Dear God, let them be so faithful to you that their lives will lead others to Christ. Let us all leave this building, dear God, regarding your Sabbath as a symbol of power, not a threat to our livelihood. May the angels take us home safely, bring us back tomorrow, Bless this country, I pray, and all those countries represented by those watching online. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. God bless you.